So, um, welcome to this session. So, it is, um, well, first of all, my name is Jutta Eckstein, and um, I came from Germany all the way to here, and uh, it's always a great pleasure to be here. here. So it's my third time to edge in India, because we enjoy a lot. Um, I want to talk about my latest book, which is the company-wide agility with beyond budgeting, open space, and sociocracy. So it's a lot of stuff putting together. And in this session, I want to focus on what open space and sociocracy can do for business agility. The point is, if you think about business agility being something for your whole organization, then um, it's not about doing more of the same. So not doing what you know from actual and doing all of it, like having all daily stand-ups or all cheerers or whatever. It is looking outside the box and looking at what's needed for real business agility. And so really outside the box, that means, and that's what we did, looking at what's really out there. And there's a lot of stuff out there. Some came out of Agile, others is like uh, separate scenes where, where stuff has been developed and people don't necessarily know from each other. And so we, we kind of explore what's there and what could be used for business agility. And what to, to us sounded the thing that's the best combination is exactly those beyond budgeting, open space, the surface and Agile. And the acronym for the first letter, so B and then OS from open space, S for sociocracy, and the A for Agile, just gets together for the Bossa Nova. And the Bossa Nova, actually, maybe just for, for that background too, it's for the Bs. And it means it's a fusion of samba and chess. So it's a kind of music. And as a fusion, our Bossa Nova is a fusion as well. And because it's a mix of these different streets. And Bossa Nova is also an intricate dance, and like a dancer, what business agility requires from organizations, or in order to do that, what you need as an organization, is like dance, you adapt to your surroundings, which for dancers is the music and the people who are also on the dance floor, but also with your dance, you have influence on the musicians. And that's the same thing, actually, for Bossa Nova or business agility band in the organization. Well, and the last uh, meaning of Bossa Nova means new trend, way that that's kind of what we did together. So now here I want to talk about like the two areas, open space and sociocracy. So first of all, who knows about open space? So, uh, not everyone, but what I know. So open space actually comes from uh, facilitation. It was a facilitation technique. And the, the thing that's important here to know is completely based on self organization, which means one is invited to bring up anything that that person thinks is important. And so it, it's a, a possibility to address any kind of stuff that's critical. That's something new, that's an innovation, that's an idea. However, it's not only bringing stuff up just for the fun of it. This passion of following what you think is important is always bound by the res by responsibility. And the responsibility in an open space setting, so as a facilitation technique, would be like the overall theme or topic. Applying it in an organization, it is the overall strategy, the vision. So it's not everyone can just do anything. It is like it should support the organization. Then what's coming with the passion is as well that you have the responsibility to learn and help others to learn, which goes also back to what you um, maybe see in Naresh's uh, opening where he said the law of compete that we want to apply here at the conference, which is you go somewhere else whenever you don't learn anything anymore, or if you can contribute to others' learning. And that's an open space principle. So that's exactly that thing that also goes with the passion. And um, open space is also based on 
empowerment, which means really just, well, they can happen and can be inspired by anyone. So it's not, you don't have to be in a specific position then. So that, that one is vital. Then sociocracy is maybe something uh, fewer people have heard about. So by definition, it's ruled by the socios, which means by people who know each other as partners, which is related but different to democracy. So democracy is ruled by demos, where demos in Greek is the mass. So the people don't have a partnership. They are not related with each other. So that's the, the huge difference between sociocracy and, and democracy. However, it's kind of a subset of it, and it is designed for organizations. And the key thing is that the feedback is built in the structure. So, we, and we will look at this, what, what this means, how this works. Another key thing is that sociocracy ensures that every voice gets heard and no perspective is different, so that we know to hear from everyone. Now, I want to uh, dive into some of these details of what it means. So, first of all, about making decisions. Because the way we are making decisions, no matter on which level, so in like a common decision or decision within a team or a team because we are working on the same product together, um, what we see very often is that a full idea is missing. And there is a reason for it. First of all, maybe uh, a question to you, what kind of decision-making do you know? What comes to your mind how, how you can make a decision? Randomization, right, just by random, yeah, you roll a dice and then debate, right, yeah. And then uh, probably coming to a closure with some consensus, for example, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which is uh, off the top down, like an autocratic decision. Yeah. Consent and consent is actually the thing that I want to explain here because it's part of sociocracy. So there are different kinds of how you can make a decision, and the thing is, not every kind of decision making is good for every decision. So. You need to look at what's most appropriate for making a decision in your context. So also the thing that I'm suggesting now is not necessarily the one you want to do all the time. So the, probably the, the two ends that you are seeing very often is like autocratic decisions are very quick in making the decision, but often they take longer for implementation because the buy-in is missing. And Consensus decisions are the ones that typically take a very long time to be made, but the buy-in is there. So the implementation is very fast. <laughs> and then there are some things in between, like a democratic decision, decision where the problem is that the uh, minority voices are lost and overheard because only the majority are. Now, what I want to look at is the, what um, was has brought up already is consent decision. So a decision by consent is, well, it sounds a bit similar to consensus, but it's not. It means that um, we decide based on acceptance and not based on agreement. So for a consensus decision, the typical question is more, are we all of that decision, if we all agree with that. Versus for consent, we are asking, oh, can we all live with that decision? So is it in our range of tolerance to go with that? Which is a huge difference because it opens up a whole new field. If it's not really in agreement with like everything, but I can tolerate a lot. So the thing is, we are asking if there is any paramount of objection. And if somebody has an objection, then that objection that's also different than in a consensus way is then really 
owned by the whole crew making that decision, which means if, um, pointing at you, Jane, you would have an objection, and then I think like, okay, how can I pull him over? That would be more the consensus way, so I try to argue with you and convince you that, well, my point is much better. Um, in a consent way, it would be, oh, great, Jane is having an objection, probably we have overlooked something, and we need to find out how to solve that objection, which would make our decision much better. So that's the, the idea of that, so that the objection is then owned by everyone. A, a few more kind of tips to that. So one thing is, um, which always goes with consent decision, if it's good enough for now, safe enough to try, which goes a little bit with the trials we heard from Linda. And the good enough for now, safe enough to try is also often helping just moving, moving forward. Another thing that helps there, at least I think, is putting a timestamp to a decision, saying, well, good enough for now for maybe the next three months, and then we look at the decision again, and maybe we have to revisit it and make a different decision, make the next trial. So that, these are things that are helping really a lot to, to move on and, and to get the buy-in from everyone. The, the way this is also working is that we really want to hear from everyone. And that's uh, uh, and for me, one thing that I learned as well when I learned about sociopathy. In Agile, we often use the, um, like the thumb voting. So I'm with it or I'm, I'm, well, I'm in favor or I'm with it whatever the majority says, or I object. Um, I realize just making that signal is, at least for me, something completely different than if I have to verbalize and say, I consent or I have an objection. It's um, more, probably more commitment. And it might be just me, and it's not for everyone like that, but signal something is just um, more... I would say disconnected from the person then talking about it. So going around and asking everyone if the person will consent or have an objection. So that's the consent decision. Um, this can be used in all kinds of ways. Yeah, so you can start, even if you are not looking at business agility, the big thing, you can look and use consent decisions in your teams and if you have a policy decide upon in your retrospective for them. That's, that's one way of using it. But it can go up all to the fourth level where you make decisions based on consent, right? So it, it's something you can start everywhere. And so I kind of disagree with what you said, Shane. So you can make small steps also with those surfaces. It doesn't have to be like rolled out completely in one go. Okay, another another thing from sociopathy um, talks about roles and hierarchies, and I want to start with electing people to functions and tasks. So whenever you have um, the need for coming up with somebody taking over the responsibility for something, sociopathy provides a way of doing that, and it starts with everyone in that group that person do something for or it could be a representative of that group or taking whatever kind of ownership over some responsibility. We first start with verifying what's the responsibility for that role. Then we ask everyone in that group to make a suggestion for a person we think could fulfill that role. And we write it down. Writing it down it's kind of what you probably have heard from planning focus sometimes that which is it's often better to make up your own mind than kind of going with a majority or some thought leaders in your group. So you first make up your mind, write it down, and this is then collected. So I write down in this way, for example, I, Yuta, nominate Tom for that role that we are looking for. Everyone is doing that. We are collecting those little uh, suggestions, and then we have our list of proposals. Then we go around and everyone is saying, okay, what's the rationale? So why did I nominate Tom for that? Well, maybe I have seen Tom doing something like this in the past, and therefore I think he's really qualified for that kind of growth. 
And so we go around and everyone explains why Tom, why Ben, Ellen, again, Ellen and Tom and Bill. After we've heard that, we do another round and go, and which is called the change round, asking everyone in that group, now that you have heard the rationale for the different suggestions, do you want to still stay with your suggestions or do you want to change your mind and suggest somebody else? So, then, as we see in that change round, well, some people kept their nominations, others, they changed their mind and suggested somebody else. And now one thing happens, which was also a bit kind of weird for me at the beginning, so what I needed to learn is here in sociocracy, it's very clear that we say it's the facilitator then going around and saying, okay, I've heard all of what has been suggested, and based on that, I suggest we nominate, for example, Ellen to take over that responsibility. So it's kind of an autocratic decision, if you will, which for me felt weird because as a facilitator, I learned, well, I still stay neutral, I'm not interfering. So here it's very clear, well, no, you're suggesting that what I'm happening now is we are doing a round of consent. So, does anyone have a paramount of against that nomination? Is that Ellen is taking up that role? Is this good enough for now? Safe enough to try? Maybe for the next three minutes, we provide a consent on that. So, that's a, a way of electrical functions and tasks, and this is kind of what we gone through now with my model will and what I have thought about this whole thing and we have done we celebrate, right, that we managed to do so. So how do you use this? So one, one way is what I just said, well, any time when you want to have a role, a function be uh, taken by a given person, and it could be really any kind of thing. So it could be, um, for example, if you think on the team level, people who go to a given community of practice, for example, who will represent the team as in the architect's group in our community of practice in the company. Or even you might think of electing a scrum master this way. So it, it could be like anything you anyone you you think like okay gets um, more power and more probably um, support also from the group and um, if you use that thing you will be surprised I really bet that you will be surprised at what what kind of change or difference this makes it makes a big difference in like there are people nominated would never have thought of, they would never have volunteered for something, but hearing from the crew, like people think, well, you're really qualified, then they're also proud and just take a step ahead, which they normally would do. So you find out about people that you wouldn't have on your list before. And also it brings the group much better together because it's like supporting each other. And the other thing is for electing people to functions and tasks where I'm coming to right now, which is, I'm not sure if you remember at the beginning I said, so circumcy builds into that infrastructure, and I want to go into that. And if we look at a hierarchy, the way it typically is done is kind of like that. So we have a top-down thing, there are people appointed, who are like the managers of the next level, and so they're going to give you further, and it goes all the way down. The problem with that is that it is really the step down. And that's how the information flows, that's how the decisions flow. And the problem is the way back up. And we see this, and even we have a term for that, uh, what we see in organizations is when we talk about talk about little marriages and say that they are in sandwich position and sandwich position marks exactly the thing that they have been appointed top down, meaning they have to transfer the message that has been decided 
a Muslim or maybe they will talk to that, but they have to interpret that message. But somehow they are also responsible for their crew, for their team, and reporting back up, but sometimes this is conflicting. And so then that middle manager role is in that sandwich and takes a decision which side the person is representing more. And so what sociocracy says is, well, maybe we need to separate those two concerns, the top down and the bottom up, which would mean, well, we have from every level in the hierarchy somebody who is elected as a representative to the high level higher up. And in that level higher up, whenever we make a decision, well, we make it on consent, which means everyone in that group has to say say. So even if I'm a representative from the bottom up, I can object to something if it's a total object, right? Not everything that you say at the top is a bad idea. So that's the that's what's called the double linking. And of course, yeah, there's a thing where I go a bit more with what Shay said. Well, maybe it's only in a big change if you really want to do this with the whole hierarchy, but even there, you can start somewhere. Well, it starts with how you connect like several teams if you are having a large project, so that could be done, done in a doubling way, kind of bringing teams together. Another thing is um, that you use double linking, well, just starting it, and this is what I I sometimes do if a manager says, well, for this meeting, I really would need um, Doris to come along and explain that stuff to my peers. So, And then we say, okay, maybe it would be a good idea if you always bring Doris along or whoever we think would be a good idea to be a representative of our team. So kind of sneaking it in and hoping that it builds up and spreads out over the whole hierarchy that it's good actually to have a, another voice in that. Then, invitation for innovation. So now we are talking a bit more about open space um, or what open space can provide. We have heard Linda today that, well, talking about failures is maybe not, not a good idea, and I like the way she phrased it. The, the problem with failures are that often they are not seen as really opportunities to learn. And as, as Linda said, there is no such thing as failure because you always learn something, and if you learn, that's a success, right? However, the thing that I'm seeing in organization is that, well, at the top, you say, well, we need something like a culture where we fail fast and where we learn from failure and that's that's really great. But then they are not acting, calling it. It's kind of a, the lip service they are providing. And the only way that this will really be implemented in an organization is by really living up to it from the top. So a trial is what about if management and desktop management is doing like regularly kind of retrospectives, it could be a real retrospective or just of a kind of, and saying, okay, in the last two weeks, these were the failures we made and these were the things we learned from it. So just pointing out the failures, of course, is kind of weird, but what are our learnings? And by doing this, it helps everyone to understand, well, on one hand, we are all fallible, failable, we can all do something wrong. But on the other hand, and that's the really important thing, we will all be able to learn something. So really taking later as a learning opportunity. And if you start that from the top, then you could build that in. Then um, another thing is, well, having emerging teams that can follow their passion. And you might have heard about self-selecting teams, where you have something going on, like a new product, and you ask, well, you say, we need these skills, and who wants to work in which team and help that product get a go? That's already kind of open space, right? Because you're allowing people to follow their passion, followed by the 
responsibility of the product because you want to build that product. That's one way. Uh, uh, maybe um, softer way even to introduce open space is just for having open space days in your company to learn about it. And actually, this is something that's very helpful too because what it often does as soon as people learn about the principles of open space, for example, again, with a lot of what I see is happening in meetings as regular, it could be boring meetings, that people use that principle because they have gone through it during those open space days and they politely ask and say, well, I see that I can't contribute here anymore. The meeting is going into a direction I'm not really in. And so I think I would help the organization in a better way if I go to another place, for example, to work on the stuff I'm working. So taking that principle and using it like in all kinds of meetings is, is a way of expanding yeah, the space building in your company. Um, if you really want to do it, then the thing is more really inviting at everyone in the company to come up with ideas for awesome products. That's, for example, how Gore is doing it. So the outdoor equipment company, or Valve, is doing it. It's a games company. So anyone can suggest a product. And the key thing is, well, if that person finds enough people, meaning there are enough people who say, well, that's a cool idea, I'm really passionate about going with that and help with building that product, it's a go. So there is no other kind of management decision, we will build that product or not. It's only finding enough people who have the passion around that product. And if there are not enough pa passionate people, well, we will not do it. So that's really taken open, taken open space for innovation in your company by taking all the ideas that are there in your organization already and use those and go with them. However, as I said, that's probably the kind of the highest level as you can go with using open space in your company, but you can start small, for example. Meeting, that's one thing, or self selected piece, another thing, so it doesn't have to be like the, the building. Um, there is one other thing which goes with open space. You see this big thing, but it's kind of like a board thing. And I want to share that story from um, ING actually last year here at the conference. There was the CTO and provided a keynote, and what they do, and I think he didn't talk about this thing, and it might be that it's new, but what they do now in their four meetings, so where the board of directors is meeting, they have put away the table. So they don't have that table anymore in their room. And what they said, just putting away the table changed the conversation, and it changed completely. So now they are either sitting in a circle or they are having a stand-up meeting. And this way they communicate differently than if they are hiding behind the table. And it's another, maybe, well, on the one hand, it's a little thing, removing the table. On the other hand, removing it from the whole thing. Um, but it helps you implementing something like a the organization. And again, you might think of removing a table in your conference. In our book, what we do is we provide a lot of what we call growth. And, well, also as Linda is saying, we are not scientists, but what we are doing with the probe is we are providing the context for the probe. We are pro 
providing a hypothesis what we think you will where we will, you will get when you implement that probe and then we come up with one or several experiments you can try where we also say okay that's how you can measure it so a pre-measure and a post-measure so it's a bit more scientific than what we often do when we say we experiment so I'm not saying we are completely in Way how it has started today, but so. So, um, as we heard from Shane, if we're doing business agility, what's absolutely in our focus is the customer. And probably you can talk to almost any kind of organization, even if it's not doing business agility, they will say, Of course, the customer is our, in our focus. What else? But not always is it that people live up to it. They do different things, they act in a different way. And so one thing, one probe that we call our performance evaluations really reflect the customer focus, or as I now label it, do you really need it, is that, well, often other values are rewarded and not the values where you focus on the customer. Now what our hypothesis is, well, if customer focus is really at the core of performance evaluation, then customer satisfaction will improve. And so if we create a pre-measure for that, what's the customer satisfaction right now, and then we make a post-measure afterwards. And the experiment that we came up with, well, you, if you have different, different units, and a unit could be a team versus another team, or a department versus other department, so you define the size for that too. And you invite one experimental unit, meaning also that they know what's going on, and ask them to write their own performance evaluation criteria, which should focus on what is on their work and should reflect the customer interest. So having that in the focus. So what you do with this, first of all, well, it's based on invitation. Then, which is basically actually, um, it's also not my, my big learning that that for me at least by now is kind of point by space what they open space. <laughs> and um, now they get people come up with their own measuring criteria, which is a completely different thing than if it's somebody else that says, oh, and this is how I will measure your performance. Right? So now everyone comes up with, this is how we think this will help us to get better in satisfying the customers. Right? And so you do that, and then you make a post measure. And, well, if customer satisfaction doesn't improve, or maybe it even gets worse, okay, you know something, maybe you need to have this experiment. Uh, one way of doing it. And um, I'm sorry, I lost my mouse. That's the that's my problem. Okay, so the, we in the book we provide a lot of probes where you can make little trials, little experiments, and well, some are more at the higher level, like they are maybe really to management board level. Some can be really tried everywhere, and the the way we are doing it is again, so we have the background, so you can reflect if this background fits all your also your situation. Then you compare the probes that are there, if this is where you want to go and what you want to do about it, and then if yes, still you try that experiment and see again, well, has your situation improved or not. What we also suggest is that you then report from your experiment because you want everyone to learn about that. So you are also publishing it. So that's 
and the, the cycle we envision and what we really think also this is the agility is not about well even if I think the book would be really, is really great but it's following that book as the recipe actually is not really the recipe it's really keep on learning by probing and getting better and now back to your magic wand. So what I hope that you have seen what you can do when you combine open space and social surface is on the one hand using consent decision for getting this full buy-in. And if you have full buy-in, you can implement all kinds of changes much quicker. So that's the, uh, the important thing about consent decision. However, I said it at the beginning, but I think I didn't repeat it. It doesn't mean that you make every decision in a consent way. What it means is more that, on the one hand, policy decisions are made. Most often you do by consent. And on the other hand, you can also decide on consent that, let's, let's go technical, deciding if we use this framework or that framework. Um, we ask you because we know you know that stuff. Like you will explore it and you will come up with the right decision. So we by consent we decide we want to do it on the next day. That's fine too. Then uh, the double linking is the thing for empowering teams and individuals and building feedback in the hierarchy. And with that, on the one hand, you can start where you are with the hierarchy, which most of organizations have. But you also make the hierarchy agile because the feedback is hardwired in the structure. Then the third thing is that you can use this election for people to function and task, which allows you to quickly find new leaders if you need different kinds of leadership skills. So things are changing and at First, maybe it was me being in the lead for something, but now we need something else, and I'm not the one who has that skill. So maybe we elect Mia Mia for doing it, but she knows that better. And uh, the fourth thing is inviting everyone that they can follow their passion and embrace ideas, and this allows us to continuously innovate. And because, well, Everyone has a good idea, and we don't want to miss them out. And any idea we can't miss them out because we're sitting in the back. And it's funny. I heard the other saying that it's so often this morning people can be surprised, and I had it already in my slide. I thought, oh, it's really the thing, and people can be surprised if something goes with open space because you really should be open. All ideas by anyone, and so that's the, the other thing of it. And I believe I need to remind you to look at the time for questions. Yes, I don't know, is there a microphone coming or? Give an example where the work meeting the other people. Yeah. Yeah. What if the from your experience of this and what if the person who is elected, he or she is going to be. Very good point because I skipped that completely and it, it came up. I, I would think about it a bit later, but I thought, well, now it's late. So I'm really glad you are asking that. So, one thing that I missed um, is so, as a facilitator, for example, I'm I'm um, making a suggestion and, a, well, a proposal. And we have the consent round, right? And saying, like, is there, is it good enough now? So I'd have to try with Ellen, right? And then the last person we are asking is then Ellen. 
So the person we nominated, and I didn't say that. So it's not that we are going around in the same whatever order, it's we going around in any kind of order. The last person we ask is Ellen. And there's the one reason that that person knows the support the person is having. That's often a, a strong thing already. And then the other thing is after knowing that the support is there, and then Ellen might say, well, I object. Ellen can say the same thing as everyone else. They are consenting or objecting. And my objection is, and very often, and I have seen that several times, that then there came an objection. But by having the support of everyone, it was very easy to get, um, kind of get over that objection or resolving it. So it might be that, um, at least that's a typical thing that I, I have heard. Well, I actually really don't have the time because I have, I have this and that and that going on. And now taking on this responsibility, I really don't know how to do it. And so with the support of the group, but then it is a thing that people say like, oh, I can really help you with this one. And, and maybe that one is done already. And so they are helping together and freeing up the time or something like that. Like, and, and it can also go kind of do all the work in your new person, whatever it is. So so the group is bound strong up together with that, so the objections are resolved. However, it might still be the case that the person says, well, I, I object, I'm not going with it, and which means uh, the facilitator will do another person. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thanks for the session. This is the so you mean like what could be a very first step in, in doing it? Well, of course, uh, the, the classic answer should be buy my book and read it. Right. <laughs> so I have to do some science fiction. No. Um, so really you can start at any level. And as I said before, you could be using consent in a meeting. And, and I did this without talking even about sociopathy. So people often I'm working with not necessarily know what we are using here. We just found a way which helps us to get quicker with two decisions. And Actually, having said that, what I found as well, um, coming up with decisions by consent is much is is a great tool also for bills. Sometimes I feel it even works better in a virtual setting, so where we all are remote and are connected, than in, a, in another one, probably because it's more likely that people are disciplined enough that they go round. And not everyone is shouting and kind of, oh, and now I want to say something, but they're more like, okay, let's do this round and everyone needs to get hurt. So, starting with the consent decision is something that's kind of easy. Um, introducing the principles of open space is another thing that I think is, it doesn't really work much. And then again, Looking at different probes, and of course you can come up with your own probes. The, the key thing I believe for probes is kind of what Linda said: coming up with a hypothesis. What do you think you want to change, or how should the world look different after you have done that experiment? Then measure what's the situation right now in this respect. Do the experiment and do a post measure if it has changed or not. And it can be a real tiny step. Again, we have, oh, I don't know the number, but we have like a bunch of probes, experiments, and probes that you can try. Uh-huh. So for the top down, the, the thing is, at the moment, I have the feeling it's easier to implement a change like that because people are talking about the book world. They are talking about 
digitalization and how every every company gets digital and is a software company, although it doesn't know yet. And in software, we, we are using Agile a lot, and with that, it spreads far over the company, and companies are desperate to, well, do something about that digitalization and be more innovative and be able to make it But still, they need to they need to know what are the options. And so here I am again, by the book. <laughs> Go there. I had a question. Yeah. Um, in the voting and nominating, are you allowed to nominate yourself? Ah, that's also a very good question. Yeah, you are allowed to nominate yourself. And even as a facilitator, I'm allowed to nominate myself. However, everyone else, if I nominate myself as a facilitator or not, I have to provide a rationale why I think I'm really qualified for that, which is fine. Because I really might be the person who pulls that job good enough to know and all say something bad. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Lata. Uh, this is just out of curiosity. Do you have any kind of statistic which says that con consent based decision making is better than the other kinds of decision making, like random or debate? That's a good question. So you are asking about evidence and probably scientific evidence. Actually, I don't, which doesn't necessarily mean it's not out there, but I'm not aware of it. The only thing that I can tell you is that I found in, in the way when I was using it, and I'm using it a lot, that it's really helping on the one hand getting the buy-in, and on the other hand also that, um, well, you hear Really, everyone's voice. You hear from people you not often hear about, and so it seems the decisions are better. However, saying better is uh, actually reminds me on something else. Well, I said already good enough. And now say enough to try several times. It's not about making the best decision. Neither for whatever we are deciding upon or finding the best person for that role. That's not what it is. We want to move on because we don't have the time and we will only know if it's the best decision after it's implemented. So that, that's the other thing. It just should keep us rolling and move forward. I don't know. Okay, so thank you very, thank you very, very much. much thank you.